of your Bible this morning, if you have a Bible with you, uh, what, Old Testament and New Testament, the first Exodus 3, verses 13 to 17. This is the uh, famous uh, burning bush moment with Moses, and then Philippians 2, 5 through 11. So Exodus 3, 13 to 17. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm going back and I'm re-preaching, not word for word. I've made some substantive, some serious substantive changes to the sermon, and I will to others, but I'm going back and revisiting some old sermons during uh, the month of July. And uh, this morning, I'm revisiting what is probably the most technical sermon I've ever preached. Uh, and uh, I thought about not re-preaching it as I was going through it for just that reason, but I finally decided that... Uh, the point here is just so good for us to reflect on uh, that if you were here six years ago when I preached this, uh, I hope it blesses you again or maybe for the first time. And uh, if you weren't here six years ago, I hope it blesses you this morning. Uh, this morning it deals with a really interesting and, and really truly very important issue regarding God's name in the Bible and how God's Old Testament name, the Lord, in all capital letters is usually how your Bible has it, becomes synonymous with the name Jesus, and about why that's actually very important for us, important for the way that we read the Bible, and then also the way that we think about God's relationship with us and, and with, his, with his church. And so this morning, I want to talk about what the name, the Lord in all capital letters, means. And for that, we're going to look at Exodus 3, verses 13 to 17, which is where God first reveals that name in the Bible. And then I want to step back and I want to talk about a basic but really important textual issue regarding the Old Testament name, the Lord, uh, and how that connects them with the name Jesus in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And, and then hopefully I'll kind of wrap it up with why that should matter to us. Uh, so let's read Exodus 3, 13 to 17, then we'll turn over to the New Testament and read Philippians 2, 5 through 11. We'll pray and then we'll uh, reflect on all this together. So Exodus 3, starting in verse 13, reading through verse 17, this is in the middle of God's encounter with, or Moses' encounter with God in the burning bush. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt, and I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now let's slip over together to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thus far, the reading of what can only be God's own word. Uh, let's pray together. Our God, we want this morning to understand the meaning and the power of your name and what it says to us about your relationship to us and, and how we are brought into communion with you and saved through your uh, incredible love. Uh, but Lord, we know that your word will not be effective in our lives unless your spirit also blesses it to us. 
And so, Father, we pray now that your spirit would give us ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to believe this word that you have uh, given to us. Uh, Father, may the words of my mouth as your preacher and may the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight and made so through the work of the Spirit. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, So first, what does the name Lord in all capital letters mean? Well, in Exodus 3, 13 to 14, you have this super interesting conversation between Moses and God. I'm going to read that again. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Uh, Just to catch us up on the context a little bit, because it's important, right before Exodus begins, the Israelites are living in Egypt because God had made Abraham's youngest son, or excuse me, uh, Jacob's youngest son, Joseph second only to Pharaoh in power, so that he could save the Israelites and the Egyptians and really the surrounding nations from starvation during this terrible seven-year famine. Uh, But after Joseph's death, a new Pharaoh comes to power. He sees the number of the Israelites who are living in Egypt. He fears their strength, and he enslaves them and begins to oppress them uh, terribly. But they keep growing in number. So Pharaoh orders the murder of all the male babies in Egypt. But Moses is spared because his mother, in that great act of faith, right, hides him in a stream by the palace. He's adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, and he's raised up in Egypt. But then in chapter 2 of Exodus, Moses kills an Egyptian who was beating one of his fellow Israelite brothers. And then Moses has to flee to the desert where he marries Zipporah and becomes a shepherd for his father-in-law, Jethro. Uh, Then at the beginning of chapter 3, while looking after some sheep, Moses sees this strange bush, which is on fire, but is not being burned up. So when Moses goes in for a closer look at this crazy thing, God speaks to him from the burning bush and tells him that he's going to use Moses to save his people of Israel out of Egypt and the land of slavery. And that brings us up to our section. So Moses hears this crazy, frightening word from God. You, Moses, are going to be my instrument to deliver Israel. And Moses is understandably not excited about this job. And so he asks God a question, actually a really surprising question. What name should I give to Israel when they ask who sent me? Uh, Now, this question is often understood to mean that Israel had potentially forgotten who her God was, Uh, but I actually don't think that's true. I don't think it's a question about forgetfulness, especially because Israel never asks Moses that question in Exodus. As a matter of fact, Israel immediately recognizes God's name when Moses comes to them. Uh, So I don't think this is a question about familiarity I don't think Moses is worried that Israel will think that their God is a stranger. I think it's a question about relationship. I think Moses is asking, what kind of relationship does God intend to have with his people? What name are you expecting us to use for you once this redemptive mission starts? Uh, there's There's a common movie trope where you have an orphaned child that's taken in by a family, and that child knows the name of the husband and the wife. We'll call them Greg and Sally, because I don't think I have any Gregs and Sallys here in the congregation. And if I do, there's no intention to be related to real people. Whatever that disclaimer is they put in movies, you have that there. Uh, anyway, that orphaned child will use those names, Greg and Sally, when they talk, when, when she talks to them, but she won't use the name mom or dad right? At least not until the very end of the movie. And the whole story spins around the question, what is the name that this child will attach to these people? Will it always be Greg and Sally, or will it eventually be dad and mom? Uh, And it's not also just a question of whether or not the orphan child will receive them as mom and dad. It's also a question of whether or not Greg and Sally really want to be mom and dad? Uh, Will they act like mom and dad? What name is ultimately going to be used for this relationship? Will it be Greg and Sally and whatever the daughter's name is? 
Or will it be mom and dad? Will they be a family? And this naming dynamic that we see in all these kind of movies is actually here in our text. Back in verse 6, God gives us what we might call his more formal name. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses recognizes that name, and so does Israel uh, when Moses comes to Israel and says that this is the God who's coming to save them. See, the heart of Moses' question isn't, what should I call you formally? That name's already been given. It's a relational question. When the people ask what kind of relationship, what kind of role does the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob want to have in our life, what shall I say to them? Uh, does this sound familiar? When people ask us, who is God or who is Jesus? Uh, the question isn't usually one of identity. It's one of relationship. Who is Jesus to me? What kind of relationship can God and I have together? And I think when we hear the question this way, we're better able to feel the loving power of God's answer in verses 14 to 16. So I'll read that again. God said to Moses, verse four, six, verses 14 to 16, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So God gives Moses and his people a name that is going to define their relationship forever and ever and ever. This is my name through all generations. What is the name? Well, it's not mom or dad. It's Lord in all capital letters. But actually, Lord there is, short, is a shortened form of God's name, just like Matt is a shortened form of Matthew right? The longer name is, I am who I am. And here's where the sermon starts to get a, a little technical, but bear with me. Uh, you're all probably aware that this statement is usually interpreted as a, a statement of being or of existence. We take I am who I am as meaning that God is telling us here in his name that I have always existed. I always was, I always am, and I always will be. Uh, that is great theology. You should all believe that. Uh, but when it comes to the Hebrew grammar, that is not a good interpretation. Uh, without geeking out, geeking out over the Hebrew here, um, I'm just going to give you the translation of this very terse phrase. Uh, I've stole this from Christopher Seitz, one of my favorite Old Testament scholars. It brings out the meaning a lot more clearly. The best way to translate this phrase is, I will be named by what I will do. I will be named by what I will do. In other words, God is telling us that the definition of his name is going to come from the actions that he will take. Uh, you will know my role in your life. You will come to know the relationship that you and I will have by the things that I am going to do. And then what things does God go on to do? He saves Israel. He saves them from slavery in Egypt, which the Bible describes as living death. He provides for them in the wilderness. He hears their prayers. He prevents them from becoming re-enslaved by the Egyptians. He guides them day and night like a shepherd. He shades them from the sun. He keeps them in peace in the evening. Right? He adopts them into his family at Mount Sinai. He, he blesses them with life, and he blesses them with his word, and he blesses them with rest. And then, of course, most famously, maybe not most famously, but on top of all of it, uh, he forgives them when they betray him and he brings them back. In fact, 
becoming the forgiver of our sins is so intrinsic, that is so definitional, so foundational to God's name that in Exodus 34, verses 5 through 7, God actually gives us this version of his name. I'm going to read it for you here. This shows up, by the way, throughout the entire Old Testament. This is foundational and definitional to who God is. Exodus 34, 5 through 7. The Lord, the Lord, all capital letters, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. This relationship is encapsulated and summarized in God's name, the Lord, in all capital letters. Our God shall be named for us for throughout all generations by the things he will do. And in fact, it's from this name that all of other God's names and what we might call his nicknames are derived, right? Friend, Father, Shepherd, King, Mother Hen, Rock, Fortress, Provider, one of my favorites, the God who sees, or the one I want to think about a little bit more, Savior. Uh, but to talk about that one a little bit more and to help us connect this to Philippians 2, I need to get technical again. Um, and this is actually the most technical part of the sermon. But again, bear with me because I think, the, I think this is amazing. I think it's profound and I think it can potentially be even revolutionary uh, for some of you. Uh, it was for me. Uh, you'll notice that in your Bible, and you can see it right there in Exodus 3, 15. I've been talking about it this whole time. Lord is written with all capital letters, right? Why is that? Have you ever wondered why that is? Uh, it's because of something that the Hebrew language can do that English cannot do, but Hebrew can do, called the Ketiv Kare. So in Hebrew, you don't have to remember this, but I'm going to explain it so it, you at least know I'm not making this up. In Hebrew, you can take the consonants from one word, the Ketiv, the word that is written, and you can put the vowels on it from a completely different word. That's the kare, the word that's said. Kativ means to be written. Kare means to call out. The kativ kare. You can take the consonants from a word written, and you can overlay it with vowels from another word, the kare. And that tells the reader who's reading this out loud, I know you see this word, but I want you to read this different word. Uh, so in Hebrew, you can take the vowels from the name Luke, U and E, and you can put them on the consonants for my name, Matt, so M-T-T, -T, but you put the U and the E there. And that tells the reader, hey, I know it says Matt in the consonants, but I want you to read Luke whenever you see this word here. So in Hebrew, the word translated as Lord in all capital letters has the consonants from the ver word to be, yod He vav He or yod He He uh, Adonai, uh, Yahweh, uh, the vowels from the word Adonai, meaning Lord, written on top of it. Thus, whenever you get to our God's Old name in the Old Testament, you read Lord in all capital letters. You're reading the kare, the word called. You're not reading the word, the consonants. Lord in all capital letters is telling you that God's name here, we're using the kare, the word called, the word Adonai, Lord. We're not using the consonantal pronunciation. The consonants are not being spoken. Okay, now I've said all that. Why did they do this and why does it matter? Here's where it gets cool. So hopefully you followed. You have the consonants for the word to be, the vowels for the word Adonai. You read Lord because you're reading the Kare, right? You're reading the word Lord. Okay, why does that matter? It matters because Lord, in all capital letters, is not God's name, at least specifically. Uh, what was God's name specifically? How do you pronounce that word? No one knows. No one knows. We have some educated guesses, but no one knows. And that's why we translate it this way. And here, I know all of you are immediately asking this question that I myself asked. Well, how did the pronunciation of God's name get lost? Right? Like, wouldn't you think that God would take special care to preserve the pronunciation 
of his name so that we would know the name to call on when we pray to him? And here's where I want to make a suggestion to you. And that suggestion, based on the idea of inspiration, the idea that it's God who writes and preserves the Bible so that in all generations he can speak his living word to us, is that the pronunciation of that name was not lost. It was suppressed. And God suppressed it. And God suppressed it for a very specific reason, which we can see in the New Testament, so that the name Lord could be made identical with Jesus' name in the New Testament. So that when you see Lord in all capital letters, you in your head will say the name Jesus. Look at Philippians 2, 5 through 11 again with all of this in mind. He says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And just to stop there for a second, notice that this is simply a restatement of the way Jesus saves us, the way that Jesus delivers us up from slavery to sin and death to freedom and life and righteousness through the forgiveness of our sins, right? Like this is the point of the description to tell us what Jesus has done. This is what Jesus has done for us. Now, pay attention to verse 9 with me. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. What is the result of Jesus' saving actions for us? The result is that Jesus, the text tells us, receives the name Lord. The name of Jesus becomes completely identified with the name of our God in the Old Testament the God who delivered his people out of Egypt and forgave their sins at Sinai, is the same God who came down from heaven and died on the cross and rose again on the third day to save us into his family. And that God's name is now Jesus. Some of you have maybe wondered why your visitors wouldn't know this, but I call Jesus God. I call God Jesus all the time. Um, why I do that? Why do I say, why don't I say God or Lord? Why do I say Jesus so frequently? Um, well, now you know why. Jesus is the name the Bible tells us that God gives himself so that we can know him as our humble savior who loves us so much that he came and died for us to free us and forgive us and adopt us and live forever. Our God has named himself by what he has done for us and by the relationship that he has established with us. And by the way, do you know what the name Jesus means? Savior. It means Savior. See, all of this has profound ramifications, I think, for the way we read our Bible. First, when you read the word Lord, you can sort of do a canonical kativ kare. You can substitute in your mind Jesus for Lord because his name defines our relationship with, with God and each other. Just like dad or mom or friend or brother and sister defines a relationship we have with an individual, the name Jesus draws us into a very specific and powerful relationship and history and life with God. It's why his name is a shelter, a strong tower, a refuge. It's why we're saved when we call upon his name. Because when we call out to Jesus, we aren't calling on a stranger. We're not calling on an acquaintance. We're not calling on Greg or Sally, right? 
Any more than a child calling out for mom or dad is uncertain about who it is that they want to come and help them. When we call out to Jesus, we are calling out to the one whose name means Savior because he has, in fact, in reality, in truth, saved us through his actions for us. Jesus is the name we use to rest in our saving, in a saving relationship with our God. Now, does that mean we shouldn't use any of the other names for God? Well, like, no, of course not, right? Like, God is triune, and as such, he's named himself the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's named himself the Good Shepherd, and the God of Abraham, and God Almighty, and Lord, in all capital letters, and Lord, and just one capital L, and the Giver of Life, and a bunch of other names. Like, all of those can and should be used, and they should be used frequently. Like, the point is not to replace all those names, but the point is to recognize still that there is one name, the name, that God gives to fundamentally define our relationship with him individually and together forever and ever throughout all generations. It's the name that perfectly specifies the saving, redeeming, loving, reconciling, rest-giving actions of God himself. It's the name that shows us the profound depths of God's character and love, and beloved. Uh, that name is Jesus. Amen? Let's pray together. Our triune God, we thank you for naming yourself Jesus uh, so that we can know that when we call on his name, uh, we can know that we are calling on the God who sees us, who saves us, and helps us, and brings us home. Uh, Lord, may we all take refuge in the name of Jesus and so find salvation in the God who is for us and not against us, who hears and forgives and saves and who has named himself through the redemptive actions that he has taken and through the redemptive work that he's expressing in our lives. And so, Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.